Well, good morning, brethren. Any first-time guest, special welcome to you. We're grateful to have you here worshiping with us and on our live stream. Just love to be together. Um, on Friday, Jeff DeCrife's father went to be with the Lord. He was a sweet believer in Christ, but it was uh, rather sudden, and so we lift up our, our dear brother, and he came to worship today. He said, that's what we do as believers. That's what my dad would, would delight in, that he's here to worship our God with us. So this morning, we're going to continue in Romans chapter 6. If you will turn there, uh, we are knee-deep in the believer's battle against sin. By the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have died to sin and we have been made alive to God, and we now desire to serve God with these bodies that he has given to us. Today, we're going to learn more then about this battle, and may God grant holiness of life to each and every believer here. That's my prayer for my own heart and my prayer for every one of you, and as uh, David just cried out in Psalm 51, that he would create in us a clean heart. So let's go to our God and pray. Father, I do pray this morning that by your word, that um, as we have learned the freedom that we have in Christ, God, we want to give our bodies to serve you. Lord, we're done with those dark days of serving only ourself and our lust and our sin. And we thank you that you have made us alive and you have set us free from the dominion of sin. Now, God, you've given us new hearts that love you, love others, hearts that want to please you, serve you with the days that you give to us. God, awaken that in every heart here this morning by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray now, Lord, meet us as we open up this word. Let it be a time where we join heart, mind, and soul and worship you through the word of God. Be glorified this morning, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 6. We're looking at the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul's gospel. The gospel of salvation that can bring us into salvation from the wrath of God. And the question is, what brings the wrath of God? Sin. Sin must be dealt with. And so we've been seeing that the penalty of sin was dealt with in the person and work and death of Jesus Christ. Currently, we're looking at how this salvation has delivered us from the power, the complete dominion of sin that we once lived under. And we have hope where one day we're going to enter into the fullness of this salvation and we're going to be delivered from sin's very presence forever. That is the hope of every child of God here this morning. And so I want you to live with an eye to that glorious day of where we're all running to the, to the finish line, saved to sin no more. So we have been stuck in Romans 6 for a while. I've enjoyed it. If you haven't, I just appreciate you coming back. <laughs> Here's our outline that we've been working through. We've been working through verses 1 through 14. Paul's given us five truths concerning our release from the dominion of sin and we saw an antagonist in verse 1, should we just continue in sin that grace might abound? Verse 2 is the axiomatic truth. How can you who died to sin still live in it? The argument that took three weeks to work out of all these indicatives of what God has done. Don't you know that when Jesus died on a cross, you died on a cross. When he was buried in a grave, you were buried. When he was raised, you have been raised to walk in newness of life. You've been joined to Christ, and what happened with him now, you, it happened to you. And so you're free to walk in newness. And then we looked at our attitude then that we must have the first command in Romans, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, to take this from your minds of knowing doctrinal truth and to get it into your hearts so that now we can begin, how do I live as a child of God? And that's what this morning we'll move into the application and I, I hate to even say this, it might take us three weeks to work through the application, maybe two. I'm praying still. Uh, verse 12 through 13 then, let's start. Let's come together now and make application to these great truths that we have been learning in Romans. Therefore, <clears throat> do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness but 
Present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not master, have, be master over you, for you're not under law, but you are under grace. And I, I think that could be the, one of the most important statements in the whole Bible, verse 14, and I can't wait to unfold that. So as we've been learning about how a justified believer, one who's declared not guilty, made right with God, um, how grace breaks the power of canceled sin. All of our sin is forgiven, and now we're fighting forgiven sin. So as we fight it, where does it begin? Well, it begins with a therefore. It's someone who knows this gospel, believes it, lives into it, and knows that you are not guilty before God. It's not based on how well you do, how good, poor. Your, your standing is based on Jesus Christ, and you own that, you know that, you live into that. So as we march forward, there's a therefore, and then knowing, knowing that you've died and you don't have to serve sin like you did as an unbeliever any longer, and then you need to reckon it. You got to get this in your heart and where you start living it and believing it and marching forward. And now we're going to see there's an acting after you reckon. And this order is probably the most important thing in the Christian life is that you get this order right. It isn't that you start now trying to not give your members to sin so that you can get justified. You're justified. You know what happened in Christ. You've reckoned it. And now there's something that you must do. And that's where we're going to move today. So let's take a look at what we're commanded and called to do in our lifelong fight against remaining sin, not reigning, but remaining sin as a child of God. And so let's uh, take a look then at verses 11 through 14. I'm going to call it the imperative section. And as we begin, just maybe a few centering thoughts, and then we'll unfold this passage. <coughs> sin is not dead in Christians, even the most mature and pious, but it's something that will always be struggled against until you breathe your last breath on earth. And so I keep fighting that because I know so many people who don't have assurance because they still battle against sin. And I want you to hear that clearly. You will have a battle till you finish this race. If sin is, is, not, a, if sin is not a battle, why would he command, don't let it rain in your mortal bodies? It's a battle. It will not be eradicated on this earth. It has just been kicked off mission control center. And now grace reigns over the believer's life, the new man that I am in Christ. So sin is still a presence. It's an intense enemy. And it still must be resisted. It's no longer present, but it's still resident. It no longer holds us captive, but it wants to captivate us. Sin's desire is to destroy you. It wants back on the throne. Yet it can never destroy the new person that I have become in Christ. And that's going to be our promise in verse 14. It can never have that place again because you're under grace, not under law. But it cannot control you like it did when you were in Adam. So the bottom line is you cannot ever be what you were in Adam again. Ruled and reigned and dominated by sin. And so we looked at that saying by Augustine that, that you're saved and now you're not able. You're, I'm sorry, before you were saved, you were not able not to sin. All you could do is sin. You were a slave to it. You were under its dominion. And now the freedom that has come in Christ is I'm able not to sin. I don't have to sin. As Christians, we do not have to offer the parts of our bodies to sin any longer. And if we do, we do it willfully not out of bondage. And so we don't have to sin, but will we? As one of our elders said, probably. Where is he? Thank you, Nate. I love you for that little help. Probably. So let's take a look then, guys. We are in a holy war. And I want us as a church, remember when we began 2021, I said, I want to fight for holiness together. It's a team. It's, it's a unit. And I pray that everyone's heart has been made alive for this battle. And so look with me in verse 12. And you know I'm excited because the first word. Therefore. What is it therefore? In light of everything we've just learned, that sin doesn't rule and reign. You need to reckon that 
and therefore now you can respond to these things. And, and, and this is our imperative. Here's our command. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Because of the indicatives that we've been studying in chapter 6, guys, don't let it rain. Do not let it rain. It's not your master. You don't have to listen to its orders any longer. The believer for the first time in his life can now obey this command. Before it'd be like saying a paralytic, stand up and walk. Or to blind people, look. But by the grace of God, I can obey this command. I hope every one of you see that. Thank you, Lord. You can obey this command. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies because of the grace of God. So what does this tell us as we begin our Christian life then in this fight against sin? It tells us there's a battle. Sin is an angry, dethroned monarch wanting to regain its position. It's not happy about its loss, <laughs> its new station, its defeat. It's not happy. It likes ruling. Very happy in that place of the body of sin being controlled in verse 6. Control does not like to give up. That's why mostly when you look in coaching and sports, the head coaches, when they do a bad job and they fire them, they don't say, how would you like to be the assistant coach? Doesn't work. Wives who, husbands let you kind of rule the roost and run the home, it's hard to give the trousers back. <laughs> control is hard to lose. And here it is, this sin had control and it's not just smiling going, I'm glad to be kicked off the throne. It's not happy. It wants mastery. It wants to destroy your life with itself sin. So to say to a slave who's still in slavery, don't act like a slave is mockery. But to say it to a slave who's been emancipated is saying put into effect the privileges of your liberation. Go live free. You've been emancipated from sin. It's saying put into effect that liberation that you have this morning. Sin does not have dominion over you. Therefore, don't let it control you. Don't serve its every whim. It's every suggestion. It's every command. American Christianity has lost that. Biblical Christianity demands this. Don't be a dupe any longer to sin. We're no longer slaves to it. Sin is no longer the stronger. And so get this, we are now called to that continual and irreconcilable war with sin. And John Bunyan, in his book, he called it a holy war. Spurgeon said to walk uh, from Isaiah, the, the highway of holiness. It will not end until we breathe our last breath and we leave the war forever. That's one of the great hopes of the believer is this is an intense war, but I'm going to win it and it's going to end and it's going to usher you into glory so much more sweeter after this battle. Like almost every believer I've ever talked to, heaven is I get to see Christ and I'm done with sin. So beautiful. So let's take a look at it. Do not let sin reign. Basiluo is the Greek word. And it meant to be king, <coughs> to rule, to control completely. Don't let sin control you completely again. And the only way to not let it reign is going to be to fight, to fight. So there's a determination here in verses 12 and 13. You're going to have to not let it rain. Don't give your members to sin. And then in verse 14, you're going to see a promise that is so beautiful of your absolute dependence. You can fight the rest of your life and you'll make no grounds and you'll lose. Except for verse 14 is a promise that you will not lose. You're under grace, not under law. God's going to see to it that sin never takes the roost again in your life. If it was up to you, you'd lose. And verse 14 has become one of the greatest promises of my life, that sin will not reign again, not because of Ken Murphy, because of the grace of God. I want that to do something for you this morning. You will not lose the battle against sin, not because you're so great, committed, strong, and determined, but because grace of God has you, and grace says, I'll bring you home. I lose none. I'll raise them up on the last day. Don't you like going into a battle that you know you're going to win? Makes you, 
Makes you kind of confident. Not in me. I stink. The grace of God will make sure that you win this battle against sin. That is so beautiful. Just determination will never get it done. I love that illustration. I know it's old, but Indiana Jones, when he comes up to that guy with the sword and he's flipping it all around and you're just like, what's going to happen? He pulls his gun out and shoots him and walks away. (laughs) That's me against sin. (laughs) You know, if it's just determination, you're going to lose and sin's going to reign again. If it's just dependence, just let go and let God and know the deeper life. You know where that ends? In sin. I don't have to do anything. That isn't how sanctification works, and you'll see that as we journey. This, I work out my salvation with fear and trembling because it's God who's at work in me both to will and to do his good pleasure. I have to not let sin reign. There's a command to me. There's a command, don't give my members to sin. And it's the grace of God that's going to cause me to do that. So it's both. And I, just, I, I see all these people that say, here's the secret. You never have to fight sin again. It's not a secret. It's a lie. There's a strenuous fight. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. Be a good soldier of Christ. I buffet my body and I I buffet it. I'm sorry. I buffet my body and I make it my slave. I put on the full armor of God. I'm like a farmer toiling his crop. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm running and straining every spiritual muscle. And the Greek word is agonizomai in the Christian life. And I'm working out my salvation with fear and trembling. John Owen, the great Puritan, said, Sin is always acting, always seducing, always tempting. So there can be no truce with sin. You can't coast in your battle against sin. So this is not a let go and let God mentality. We're not a glove that God fills and just wiggles the fingers. All of these books on victorious Christian living that say you do nothing will miss it. It's a determined life that is completely dependent upon the grace of God. And we're going to keep journeying in Romans till you understand what that means. But we're going to see that grace causes you to be determined. So we are to volitionally obey God. God does not obey for us. And we're being commanded to fight sin here. In Romans. So I'm going to quote from you, one of the great scholars and men of the Christian church, J.C. Bishop J.C. Ryle. And I just want you to listen to what he said about this battle. He said, It, true Christianity, admits no breathing time, no armistice, no truce, on weekdays as well as on Sundays, in private as well as in public, at home by the family fireside as well as abroad, in little things like management of tongue and temper as well as the great ones like government (coughs) of kingdoms. The Christian's warfare must unceasingly go on. The foe we have to do with, he keeps no holidays, he never slumbers, and he never sleeps. So long as we have breath in our bodies, we must keep on our armor and remember we are on enemy's ground. Let us take care that our personal religion is real, genuine, and true. The saddest symptom about many so-called Christians is the utter absence of anything like conflict and fight in their Christianity. I don't think anything could be truer than in our day, and he's saying in his his day it was that way. They eat, they drink, they dress, they work, they amuse themselves, they get money, they spend money. They go through a scanty round of formal religious services once or twice a week, but of the great spiritual warfare... It's watchings and strugglings, it's agonies and anxieties, it's battles and contests. Of all this, they appear to know nothing at all. Let us take care that this is not our own state. And so I ask you this morning, do you know anything of this battle? When was the last time you cut your right hand off or plucked your eye out to get off social media or your phone or fasted or fought in prayer against this sin. The problem is that we all too often battle sin on the backside of confession. And Paul is commanding that we must fight it on the front end. Sin must be fought on all sides, before, during, and after. Paul's focus here is on the front end, living into the indicatives that are true about us as children of God. And so do you have any fight 
in you. Has the gospel produced in your heart a holy hatred against sin that has fight? When sin knocks at the door, we just answer it like a little servant, boy or girl. When I grew up, there was this big tall guy named Lurch, and they'd ring the doorbell, and he'd go, you rang? That's what we do with sin. How can I serve you? Let me open the door. What do you, what do you have for me? Instead of a combat marine expecting the enemy when he opens the door. Everyone's got their favorite movies. I've got my top five. And one of them in there is this movie called Remember the Titans. You ever seen it? Is there anyone who doesn't like Remember the Titans? It's sin if you don't. <laughs> so Remember the Titans, there's a coach, Coach Yost. He's, he's, he's in the playoffs and he's being hometown because their team ha, uh, is integrated with black and whites. And so the, the refs are wanting them to lose so that the coach won't win. And so they're throwing the flags, calling all of these fake penalties that didn't really happen. And, and Yost finally has had it. And he calls the ref over. He goes, Titus, you call this game fair or I'll see to it that every one of you go to jail even if I go there with you. And then Yost calls the defense over and he says, I don't want them to gain another yard. You blitz all night long. Don't give sin even an inch. Don't let it rain in your mortal bodies. And I just see too many of us who just want to play with it and feed it and pet it and see how far we can go with it and give it an incubator and let it grow up and, and then be sad over our sin. And this is a call for the grace of God. I pray that he'll awaken every heart here this morning. Pastor, sin is so strong and constant. I need help. I need a battle plan. I need strategy. I need a better understanding. And I would like to give that to you now. First, I want you to notice where the battleground is. Catch this. It's not out there. <laughs> Most of our time is spent out there. It's in here. This battle is in my body and my mind. This is the home court battle. We've got a civil war going on. My homeland security is Jesus. And so I'm in a battle now with how I use this body. It's an instrument. When you see someone die, you finally realize it's a shell. It isn't what makes the person. And this, this shell that God has given to me is for a purpose. It's to serve him and others. That's why you have a body. Not to spend all your days with body beautiful and trying to comfort it and pamper it. That isn't why you have a body. You've been given a body to offer it up as a living sacrifice to God. The instrument will go in the grave. The instrument is where this battle is raging on the inside. And we'll see more in verse 13. But for now, just know that the battle is sin within, wanting to regain that, that body of sin again in verse 6, where it rules and controls, and all you do is give your members to serve it. That's what the battle I'm talking about this morning that Paul's flushing out. Second, where does sin then seek to work to regain its old station? Where is it going to come after you to try to win and gain ground? Well, look at verse 12. <clears throat> Don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey what? It's, it's lust. What Greek word do you think Paul chose there for lust? Yell it out if you know it. Yeah, if you've been at this church for a while, you should know that. It's this Greek word that your pastor loves, epithumia. That's where he's working. And so I want to try to flush that word out and teach you this morning what's going on in this battle. The rest of this chapter, <coughs> Paul's going to show us there's just two kinds of people. You're either a slave to God and you obey him, or you're a slave to sin to obey its lusts. There, there's just no in-between. There's no other alternative. This morning, who are you a slave to? God or sin? There's just one or the other. And in the gospel of Jesus Christ will bring you, either without it, you're a slave to sin, and with it, you're a slave to God. And so here's the problem. Everybody lives for something, don't they? 
There's something that drives every human being. I've met a couple that don't have any drive at all, but not many. Usually, if you ask yourself, what is the the main way that makes me feel valuable, worthwhile? What do I want people to say about me? (coughs) Sorry. What is it that makes your life significant? Is it power and influence? To have money and possessions? To have sex appeal? To have health? To have romance? To be proud to be an American? I've never seen that more in my life. To be a good parent? It's all I would care about. To be a good guy or girl? To have control? You, you use God to have control. All you want is to have control. Every time you lose it, you're going you're gonna to be out of control. Maybe it's to keep up with the Joneses. Your whole life is just comparison. Your whole life is self-pity. Whatever it is, I want you to hear this. It's, it's an epithemia if you're under its control. And so epithemia, we've talked about a lot of times, thumia is a desire. And, and what really set me free is it can be a desire for a good thing. And, and so an epi is when it becomes over. And so it's an inordinate desire. It's, it's, it's not just, I, I would like this. It's uh, these good things or bad things become ultimate in your life. So do you see where the battle's going to lie in your life? With your epithumias. The, the, these things are gonna, that you love and have to have and want, they're where the devil's going to come to try to sin, to get you to, to be controlled and under its dominion and bondage again. And so remaining sin just plays on these things. And, and, and they're good things if they're in the right place. So we all have them. Everyone has a desire. Don't you want to be a good parent? Don't you want to prosper and all these things? Everyone has good desires, but they get turned into epis because of sin. And my whole life is dealing with epis that grow up in my life and yours. We're trying to fight them. That's the Christian life is these things get ascendancy. And so sin feeds them. It tempts them. It satisfies them. It craves them. Sin tells you that if you have them, it will make your life happier than to have God. And they're always working. And, you, and you, you'll, you'll, you will get what you have always wanted if you do this or believe this or buy this or bite into it like an apple in a garden. So let me give you some examples to help you this morning to see how epithemias are working in this text. And we're trying to let sin reign in your life again. In James 4, he says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Why are you fighting in churches? Why are you fighting in your families? Why are you fighting in your marriages? Because of your epithemias. And there's these desires that you have, and I need my wife to do this to fulfill this, or I can never be happy. I need my friend to do this for me, or I can never be happy. And this is what we fight over. I need everyone to wear a mask. I need everyone not to wear a mask. I'll address that next week. But I'm telling you, is what I've seen in the last year is we have epithumias that they, they can become a good thing that becomes inordinate and controls you. Fear. You fear something you want or something you love is threatened. What do you do? You worry. An epi is you fall apart. You can't control your anxiety because it means so much to you. I'm just so anxious and overwhelmed. It's, it just, it's an epithumia, and I'm afraid because it's that big. And if I lose it, my life has no value or meaning. I'm done. Sadness. If you lose something, you're, you're sad, you're blue, maybe a little bit down. But an epi is you want to throw yourself off a bridge. There's no meaning in life if I don't have this. I'm done. Anger. You get upset when someone cuts you off on the highway. It's usually me. I apologize. (laughs) I feel the need for speed. It's terrible. (laughs) Epi is something or someone keeps you from getting that epithemia, and you can never forgive them the rest of your life. And you see that, and you're unglued. A workaholic 
who will give every second of every day to try to get that achievement to show that you can accomplish something. The politics of 2020, we saw so many epithemias, male or female attention. The list will go on and on, but they're spiritual masters, and that's what sin wants them to be. So sin comes and engages our passions and our desires, and it tries to enlist them to serve sin, and sin is a big deceiver. And it works on the inward man, and it tempts, and it entices, and it lies, and it says just a little bit, just do it once. It says, why don't we sin that grace might abound? Why don't we sin because we're not under law but under grace? It just comes and deceives you and leads you into these things. And what Paul is saying here is so beautiful. You don't have to obey these desires any longer. They can just be that, desires. Isn't that beautiful? By grace, they don't have to be epis any longer. Romans 6, you died to all of your spiritual masters, and you have a new identity in Jesus Christ. Reckon it. I have a new master. I'm free to serve him in love. And so the call to the believer is don't let sin get the mastery over you again by these epithumias within our own hearts. You're alive to God. He is now your spiritual master. And you live into that, and you believe it, and you reckon it. And in verse 13 now, you serve him. And so here's the key, why we have labored so hard in Romans. You've got to keep him as your epithumia. The, the only right epithumia is Jesus Christ. And what have you been born again to? You've been made alive to Jesus Christ. He's now your, your chief end. He's what you want from this life. He's what you're running to in the finish line. He's your controlling desire. And what are we always preaching here at, at, at this church is feed it by the means of grace and the word of God and prayer and fellowship, discipleship. Feed it. Feed this epithumia in Jesus Christ. That is the only way to overcome epithumias is with a greater desire. And so that's my daily battle against sin. That's the fight of faith. And you're going to see next week, Lord willing, by being under grace, sin will never get complete control again. It won't take you back under where your whole life is ruled and reigned by epithumias. He'll break down these things and he'll show them to us and he'll, he'll, he'll give us the cure in himself. And so every one of us, we're journeying where God's showing us epithumias. It could be kids, grandkids, hunger, food. There's, he's always showing you, you just want approval. You, just, you want everyone to know your name and glad you came and your whole life is just controlled by, I want to be loved or I want to be accepted. And as I think on this, Every lust that is offered and presented to me, I just, here's my fight. I just ask a simple question. Did they or did it ever go up on a cross for me and purchase my pardon? Here, this is what will make you happy. Did that dessert, that woman, that applause, Ever die on a cross in your place so that you could be saved? Give me Jesus. That's how you're going to fight epithumias. No lust has ever done that for you. You know what all it's ever done? Has left me broken and empty and frantic and stressed out and anxious and diseased and guilty. It's all it's ever done. It's a terrible master. And I'm going to give my life to that. Reckon I don't have to. Romans 1 through 5, the gospel. 6, 1 through 10. Are my grounds to fight against epithemias? To not let them take over my life. Again, I'm not under law, but I'm under grace. And I don't have to have anything else be the, my chief end and my goal and my hope and my desire, and I don't have to go back under that horrible life that I used to live where I was just a slave to my desires. 
You fight sin not to be accepted by God, but because you are. The war with God is over, thanks be to Christ. But it has just begun with sin to the finish line. Questions? I need you to do me a favor. In my backpack in the front is my phone. I forgot to bring it up. You can have Kelsey bring it up or you could bring it up whoever wants to. And while you're doing that, I'll keep moving. My whole application's on that phone, so without it, you guys will get to go home in five minutes. With it, you go home in 30. So (laughs) don't pray that she trips on the way up here. Okay, so verse 12 is we see that sin wants to rule us. Verse 13, it also wants to use us. Thank you, Vanna. Okay. Uh-oh, the battery's almost out. I got to hurry. <laughs> Don't let sin reign. Don't let it use you. I, this is so powerful. Sin has no members of its own. Okay? It needs yours. You got to give it to it. It doesn't have any of its own members. Sin is helpless unless we donate our members to it. It has no eye to lust with. It has no mind to think evil with. It has no feet to be swift to run into evil. It has no mouth to slander and degrade people with. It must enlist your members into service. And so the question powerfully comes, to whom will you give your members to service? Who do you want to use this body to serve is the question. Will you give your member to be the devil's errand boy? Or will you give them to serve the living God? Joshua said, choose today whom you will serve, whether it be Baal or God. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Here you go, sin. Let me give you my members for service. Take my mind and fill it with trash. Let it daydream and have immoral thoughts. Here's my eyes. Let me look and desire. Here's my tongue to slander and abuse my my wife and children and speak perverted and quote godless movies and all of these things. Here's Here's my tongue, sin. Or will you cry out as we sang this morning? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. When we sang, create in me a clean heart, man, I felt like I was in the throne room. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thy own, it shall be thy royal throne. There was a day when sin controlled and ruled your members. And you were sin's servant boy. And you've died to that. And you're alive to God. And now you can give your members to serve the king of kings the one who died on a cross in your place. Isn't that beautiful? That's freedom. Is there anything sinful about our members? No, God made our bodies. But I was thinking about it, like if you put a knife in a doctor's hands, he can do amazing things to cure and heal you. But if you put it in a psychopath, it's a dangerous tool. If you give morphine to a doctor, he can do great things to help us. But if you put it in the hands of an addict, it can do great harm. And so that's the question then, is what will I give my members to? Sin that wants to decapitate your soul, or God who gave us Christ while we were yet sinners, he demonstrated his love toward us. Who do you want to give them to? That's why there's a therefore in the Bible. These members were given to know and serve God. And because of the fall, what we learned in Romans is we used these members to disobey God. And he saved us. So now we can use our bodies for what they were made for. And I want to use my lips to sing praises to God. And a mind that knows and understands grace and affections that loves God and loves others. 
and hands that will serve God and lift up his praise and others and eyes to read his word. Do you see what sin has done to us? And do you see what grace gives back to us? What do you want to use these bodies for? Do you want to serve the one who hates Christ? Or do you want to serve the one who gave us Christ is the question of this text. And if you look with me in verse 13b, <clears throat> don't go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So it's not enough to just not give your members to sin. I know some people that's all you focus on all day, every day. But it's to not give them to sin so that I can give them to God. And just one thing that's important here is Paul changes the, the tense of the verb in this 13b, and he chooses what's called an aorist, and I think it's a constitutive aorist, and you're like, what does that mean? What well, means this? It means present yourselves to God, and it views the action as a whole. So it's not a present tense, ongoing action every day. It's, it's a settled decision when you've been saved. Is I, I've never had to tell any believer this. They know it right away. All I want to do now is serve God. Did anyone have to teach you that? It was just right away. Is It's a settled, wow, when I look at the cross and understand salvation, it's just settled in my heart. I'm going to serve you the rest of my days. It's a one-time dedication to God. It's completely and irrevocably. I'm yours. That's the heart of what it means to be a Christian. As I consider Romans 1 through 5, that I have the grace of God, I can't get over what you've done for me. And now I dedicate myself to you. I despise your glory, and now I want to use these members for your glory. I just have one purpose in my life. God. It's this truth alone that has caused people throughout history to lose their lives in this world. One life you're given, and we've wasted much of it in using our members to defy God. Now, until I go home, I'm your man. God, I want to serve you. American Christianity doesn't want to let goods and kindred go in this mortal life also. It wants, it's tried to merge Christianity and your epithumias and that you can have both. And what I'm seeing here is you can't. And we're going to fight those till we die. We don't, we don't want to lose our lives. We just want the good life. Don't you want to be a church consecrated to God? I just want all of us to join hands and give our members to make much of God, to serve him till we die. The Christian must be resolved and determined with a one-time act, I will not be moved away from this purpose to serve God. This call is not for vacillators. It's not for window shoppers. It's not for looky-loos. It's not for testers. I tried Jesus. That is not what this is. This is those who will commit all to God. Present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. Give these members to God to be used for righteousness. And the old hymn, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. And so I want you this morning to consider your two masters. One is so evil. I've watched people on their deathbeds dying of cancer, and he comes and just devours, even when they're vulnerable and weak. It's like when they're weak, he gets more bloodthirsty. Or the one who gave his son that we could have life. Who do you want to give your members to serve with this life? Thomas Cramner said, his service alone is perfect freedom. Perfect freedom is to serve God. And so in closing out, I have a whole bunch of application. I think I'm going to just do my phone. And I think what I'm going to do next week, I think I'm going to just do a sermon on the application of this and and if the elders are good with it, I, I would like to address the whole COVID 
thing from this issue. I, I think God has given me some clarity that has been life-changing for me, and I hope uh, it will bless you. And so that could be what we're doing next week. So this is last week Robin Conwell read from that interview with Tim Keller that he's not fighting cancer, but he's fighting sin. And here's what he goes on to say. We try to make heaven out of earth. And as a result, we're always unhappy because it can't be done. I'm going to call those epithemias. We spend our whole lives trying to make heaven on earth. And we just keep chasing everything here to try to find it. He says, as a result, we're always unhappy because it can't be done. And here's what's really weird. When you actually make heaven heaven, your hope, your joy, where we're going and where our reward is, the joys of earth are more poignant than they used to be. The more we make heaven the real heaven, the more this world becomes something we actually enjoy for its own sake instead of trying to make it give us more than it can. (laughs) The freedom in that is unbelievable. I keep trying to make this paradise, Denver, Colorado, and I want my marriage to be heaven, and I want my friends to give me heaven. I want financial security to finally give me heaven. I want good health to finally give me heaven. And we're just, we're always trying to find that thing that will make heaven here. And he's saying, until you finally realize Christ is it and finishing the finish line with him and being with him forever, when you can finally make that your chief end and your goal, I don't have to have heaven here. And and this weird thing happens. Now I can enjoy everything that God gives me. Even the trials and the afflictions, if my kid walks away from the faith, you know, whatever comes I can still be okay because that's heaven and that's the finish line with Jesus Christ. And that's the cure for all these epithemias. Epithemias are trying to make you find heaven here. It's everything that you think is going to finally make everything okay finally in your life. And you spend your whole life chasing it and you can never get it. So you're just, these epithemias are having their way with you. And when, when you get this, and you have the epithemias, I want to just get to the finish line and be with Christ. I'm free from all these other lusts and desires and things that I think will finally make this paradise. Paradise is having died with Jesus and been buried and been raised with him to walk in newness of life and seated with him in the heavenly places right now. That's paradise. And the one who will fight the fight of faith to make that your hope, joy, and crown you, you will not have these sins rule and reign your life ever again. Isn't that beautiful? No? It made me so happy, and you guys look sad. <laughs> All right, I'll skip the rest of it. I, maybe my one application to the sweet little kids... The, the, the little guys, you have to sit through all my sermons, and I just always feel so guilty. But li- just listen for a second then, as if you've been saved, I want you to give your members to serve God and others, and, and I want you to use it to say, yes, Mom. I want you to use it to love your brothers and sisters and try to teach them about Christ and not hit them and steal their movies and toys. And You, you have a choice every day how you want to use your members. And so I want you to come out of here and just say, God, I want to use these members for you and for others. So that's for free. The unbeliever. I got something so beautiful for you this morning. You don't have to go conquer the sins that are killing you. And everything else in this world says you got to go clean yourself up and conquer and get better. You can't. There's no way out from the dominion of sin but to come to the one who was hung on a cross and he died there for your sins. And he came and he obeyed that law that God demands for you in your place. And in that, you will be set free from the penalty of your sin that would be eternal hell. And the power of all that ruling and reigning will be broken. And for the first time, you'll have the freedom to serve God with your members. And so I offer you this beautiful Jesus Christ and he, just, he bids you, come, that you might have life and be set free from this bondage to sin. Let's pray. 
Father, I come before you and I thank you for these beauties. I thank you that we now are reigned and ruled by Christ. We're under grace. We'll never go back to this emptiness of trying to find life in this world and thinking happiness lies in our lusts. All our happiness is now found in Christ. I thank you that you opened my eyes. I, I saw no value in you, Jesus. And now you're the treasure hidden in a field and I give up everything to have you. I want to give you my members. I want to serve your commission. I want to fulfill it till I breathe my last. And I pray that would be the heart of every believer in this room, that we would repent of using these silly bodies to serve ourselves, trying to get as much as we can in these bodies. Oh God, help us to, to just die to that. Help us to reckon that we have died to it. We don't have to live that way any longer. Sin is not the stronger any longer. Oh God, help us. And I pray, I pray for any who um, have been living so long as a believer, just always in the defeatist mindset. Paul, Jesus, the Holy Spirit desires. Lord, set them free this morning from living that way. God, let them reckon this to be true and give them the grace to use their bodies with the days they have left to serve you. God, I pray that you will use this church mightily with, it, with a whole group, all these warriors that are surrendered to service to God. Lord, use us up for your name's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.